the family norm. Tonight, the life and times of Christopher and Mary Pratt, two of Canada's most celebrated artists. More purple. Don't you any purple? <laughs> Husband and wife, the story of what drives them apart. Good evening, I'm Gordon Pinsent. Christopher and Mary Pratt are royalty in the Canadian art world. Both immensely talented painters, both successful and internationally famous. And like royalty everywhere, the Pratts are the subject of much interest, especially about their complicated relationship of four decades. There's intense curiosity about how one household could nurture two artistic visions, how it could contain two artistic egos. As you'll see in tonight's documentary, Mary and Christopher Pratt who now live in separate houses in Newfoundland, have grappled with these questions themselves. Mild December at Mad Rocks near Bay Roberts, Newfoundland. Neutral ground for the most notable and complicated marriage in Canadian art. Christopher and Mary Pratt are accomplished and celebrated. Mary for her visions of life, Christopher for his depictions of dreams. But their matrimony has suffered because of their careers. Afternoons like this and a few dinners a week are all they see of each other now. Right. The grass looks like it was painted by somebody who didn't know how to paint. <laughs> it's amateur grass. The horror of the amateur. <laughs> a married couple who love each other, but for the most part, can't be together. After this Sunday outing, they'll part, return to their separate studios, and their independent lives. See that right just above the water? Oh, just yes. above the just above where it's wet. What is that slime? I don't know. Weird, it's a, it's isn't a it? really different kind of green, isn't it? Yeah, it looks really great with that purple too. What well, purple? Don't <laughs> see any purple. Uh, all that purple, it just runs right down straight from the ground. Mary's forever seeing purple. <laughs> when she's not seeing red. <laughs> I live uh, somehow or other a solitary life. I believe in the value of solitude. I think that uh, what solitude provides for you is it, it gives you uninhibited, uncompromised access to your own consciousness. And I think that's a very valuable thing. When I was a child, I used to tack papers up inside my bedroom cupboard, my clothes closet. And there was fortunately a light in there, and I used to hold all my paints in a, in a big clamshell and stick the paper up on the wall with scotch tape and do all my painting in this cupboard because I had to be alone, and it was the only place in the house where I, where I could actually be alone. And so I, I think of myself as a solitary person leading a solitary life because I think that the real life I do lead is very solitary. Mm. Mary's days, and most of her nights, are spent in her house in St. John's. People know Mary's work to be of the domestic world, food and kitchen and family. She paints vivid realism, sometimes as real as a photograph. But there's more than that. Messages and stories from her own life, like an autobiography strung from one canvas to the next. Christopher's seclusion is an hour away from Mary, in the tiny community of Salmonier, in the house that was once home for them both, where they raised their four kids and made their names in art. Christopher's work is grounded in this place, 
He can't leave. His skill isn't portable. His muse is here. But Samanir isn't a still life for Christopher. He doesn't paint it. His realism actually comes from scenes deep in his own head, things painted the way they are, but not exactly as they exist. My work, I think, makes me look like a very cool, orderly, deliberate person who plans things, structures things, uh, makes them happen the way he wants them to happen, is not satisfied unless they do turn out that way. Whereas, in fact, it really isn't like that. I'm not an ordered person. I'm not a person who's totally in control of all these things. There is a, a print that Christopher was doing uh, years ago, a silkscreen print, that he had actually just finished printing and somebody came into his, a little boy came into his studio to deliver something or other and made some sarcastic comment about the diapers blowing on the line. And uh, uh, Christopher just suddenly felt that he had not, the print hadn't succeeded if in fact this is what this eight-year-old kid thought about it. He shouldn't have paid any attention, but he did. And he, he threw the whole edition into the garbage. And Mary actually got uh, half a dozen or so of these prints that weren't busted or broken in two and hid them up in the attic. And they actually came to light about 15 or 20 years later. And they were really quite, they, they were really good. And Christopher looked at them and said, well, these aren't so bad after all. I wonder why I, why I did that. The wonder of it, discovering why those images in his head matter, is why Christopher Pratt paints. Some see him as aloof, his style austere. Sometimes it can be difficult for those who used to live at Samanir and who remember it as a vibrant place. We are welcome down there, and we go there whenever we want. On the other hand, it is my father's studio now. It's where he works, and uh, it's a sort of a serious place. And we are, as children, my siblings and I, wary of interrupting that, that delicate kind of space that he needs to work. And we all know that he needs that, and we respect it. It's much more... Um empty than it was. Well, if a woman is not living there, it sort of loses its touch. And it's very sparse looking, which that's how Christopher is. Clues of Mary's time at Samanir. Her prints on Christopher's wall. She doesn't live here anymore, even though it's the home of her husband, the place she developed as a painter and built a life. But Samanir was always a bit of a reach for Mary. She was born in 1935, the same year as Christopher, and raised in New Brunswick society in a beautiful house on Waterloo Row in Fredericton. Her father was the provincial attorney general, and he doted on his two daughters, Barbara and Mary West. I just went at it. Um, I just blasted away. And I think that came from having been brought up to think that I was perfect. <laughs> Which is awfully useful if you're going to be a creative person. If you've had parents who think you're wonderful, then you don't have any ax to grind. You, you, don't have, you don't have to relive your childhood. You don't have to reassess it. You can just enjoy it in retrospect. You can say, oh, gee, that was fun. My parents took painting and the arts very seriously. My mother played the piano beautifully until arthritis crippled her fingers so much that she couldn't. And uh, my father was an amateur painter and he believed that all women should paint pictures and do the garden and keep house and keep their husbands happy. And you know, it was the way people thought and you know, not bad. It was not a bad way to think. It just was difficult to do somehow for me. Mary went off to her father's alma mater to study fine art, Mount Allison University in Sackville, New Brunswick. Her education here was intense. 
project after rigorous project of still lifes and figure drawing, wine bottles, fruit, and models. Then into one of her classes wandered the young Christopher Pratt, who had just arrived in Sackville, leaving behind his beloved Newfoundland. Newfoundland is deep in Christopher Pratt's bones, a place he aches for when he's away. His family has roots dating back to the late 1500s, as old as Newfoundland itself. It's one of my sacred places, really. I, I sometimes find it hard to hold it together down here. Uh, I came here first, I guess, when I was four years old. Uh, I caught my first salmon here, was standing on a rock over there. I can remember being here and seeing the fish go up through, work their way up through, go on up through the Beaver River. Yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty loaded. Yeah, I love it. Christopher was born and raised in St. John's, where his father sold hardware. His upbringing was comfortable, middle class, and he spent a lot of time roaming the Avalon Peninsula. He was exposed to fishing and hiking, but not to art like Mary was. Still, Christopher felt a connection. I don't think there was ever a time when I felt I couldn't do it, which is sort of strange. But I always felt, even as a child, I felt that somehow or other this was my appropriate domain. And I remember seeing other young people who uh, probably took art lessons and I'd see them walking in Waterford Bridge Road uh, with a handful of brushes or something and I, my response was always, well, why are they doing that? Well, because I, I should be doing this. this, this is mine. He took up painting as a hobby but never considered it as a career. He had never known anyone in Newfoundland to do that, to paint for a living. For a while, he thought he'd become an engineer, but settled on pre-med. So when I went to Mount Allison, I took with me half a dozen watercolors. And uh, shortly after my arrival and my enrollment in uh, pre-med and my initiation and meeting a lot of people, I went over to the Owens Art Gallery with these watercolors in my arm, and I showed them to Lauren Harris, Jr., uh, who was director of the school, and Alex Coble and Ted Pulford, and I had never heard of these people, actually, but I showed them these watercolours, and they were very enthusiastic about them. Then Mr. Harris came in and said, that kid just brought that watercolour. You think you're so smart in here. He said, that kid can just paint rings around the whole crowd of you. And I knew that anyway, just to see it, because these were just absolutely beautiful, and I thought, you know, I've got to get to know this guy. Yeah, well, I went into the art gallery and there were a lot of nice looking girls there, there's no doubt about that, but Mary did seem kind of special to me. Uh, just so bright, uh, so, so bright. I can't really say anything else. Uh, intelligence, uh, just sparkle. You could just, it, it was a presence. When I met Christopher, he was also a sort of an outsider. He wrote poetry. And when I walked with him first, I remember um, he talked about the marshes and how beautiful they were. And I'd never heard a boy talk like that before. I watched you walking on the tantrumer, leaving me alone with nothing but the vast, low silence of the wind and marsh birds calling. I watched you walking infinitely small, smaller than the marsh birds, smaller even than the droning insects, dung flies, ants. And I could see how God could focus everything, all being, life, the universe, all secrets, in one subatomic particle, which you became, walking smaller on the marsh. And when we get to, you know, some, overlooking a hill or something outside Sackville, and it would be perhaps the snow was falling and it was kind of a nice time of the night and you know, the evening and I would say isn't this just beautiful and he would say no no it's horrible it is so boring compared to Newfoundland and I thought 
gee, you know, Newfoundland must be really something. I never rose to the defense of New Brunswick and said, well, you jerk, you know, what a thing to say to me. I used to just think, well, Newfoundland must be absolutely wonderful if it's better than this. Christopher quit pre-med the instant he was told his painting was exceptional. But to do it right, he'd need to be in Newfoundland, where he was rooted and comfortable. So he moved back in with his parents in St. John's. Mary was smitten, a 19-year-old deeply in love. She left Sackville and followed him. There was a level of support from Mary. There was a, a bohemianism. I mean, I'm, I don't come across as a bohemian. I mean, Mary and I never came across as hippies, I'm sure of that. But think about it. You know, I quit university when kids didn't do that. I was a dropout before it was coined. In September 1957, they got married in Fredericton. And just before the ceremony, Mary declared that she could have had an ordinary life, marry a doctor or a lawyer, but she opted for the unpredictable. Mary's family home on Waterloo Row belongs to her sister Barbara now. If you had taken sociology instead of fine art, you would have found out that when you marry somebody, you should pick somebody from the same neighborhood. It's yeah. a lot easier. Well, I didn't take sociology. But you didn't do anything in an easy way. Well, fine arts is not... You're not supposed to know those things if you take yes. fine art, you see. You're supposed to go into the world with your soul and your eyes scrubbed so that everything scratches and gets you the, you know, really sort of, you absorb. Mm -hmm. And so I guess I went to the Newfoundland with my eyes scrubbed clean and my senses But all tingling. that was powers of observation. You didn't sense any, anything I didn't sense that was the different. truth, yeah. you know? I didn't see it. I just saw the glitz. <laughs> Yeah, aren't you awful? <laughs> the pursuit of Christopher's career filled the next few years. Off to Scotland to art school, then back to Mount Allison, where they both graduated. By 1958, they had started a family, and Mary's time for painting had all but vanished. Three years later, they moved to Salmonier, to a small, uninsulated fishing cabin. For Christopher, it was a return to the Newfoundland of his childhood holidays, and once here, he was free to concentrate on his work. I don't think many people have any idea of the incredible labor, this business of making a silk screen print uh, the way we do it here, but it's, it can be tedious in the extreme. Christopher and his assistant Jeanette Meehan will spend up to three months working on a screen, trying prints dozens of times before they produce a final edition of about 50 or 60. It's frustrating. Lines don't line up and colors go wrong. The solvent fumes can be stifling and dangerous. And sometimes Christopher's temper can get the better of him. Uh, perhaps the greatest uh, piece of self-expression is, you know, you pick up a brick and you throw it, and it goes through something, well, by God, you've made the point. I picked up a chair here one day last summer, I picked it up over there, I threw it, it went through the window, there was a guy out there fishing in the, wind, in the river, he looked around, saw the chair sticking out the window, reeling his line and left the brook. I figure this is a good way to get rid of somebody you don't want in the river. The duds get thrown out, even if they're half good. It has to be right. There is no room for mistakes in Christopher Pratt's art world. Cloistered in Salmonier, he can maintain control. I didn't want to go to Seminary. I really didn't want to go to Seminary. But I went to a place where I didn't understand what people did. I didn't understand their preoccupations. I didn't, I simply didn't understand. I was in a foreign country. And I was in the process of having many children, four children under the age of six. This is a terrible drain on a woman. Nobody said that in those days. There was not a language. The postpartum depression wasn't even a word. It wasn't even a string of words. I mean, if you felt a bit 
off, that was the third day after the baby was born and after that you got with it. While Mary was busy in the kitchen at Salmonier, Christopher plunged into his work. He had sold a print, Boat in Sand, to the National Gallery in Ottawa when he was still in school. His new work was selling as quickly as he could finish it. Visitors started showing up at this miraculous new speck on the map of Canadian art. Richard and Sandra Gwynne made their first pilgrimage in 1966. Mary was there, but, but uh, she was you know, little wife at that time. And he took us into his studio and showed us his work. And I, I interviewed him then, so made up the idea of interviewing and sold it to Time, uh, and wrote the story, which was the first in a big, a big magazine about him. And I had no idea, no idea whatever, that Mary was a painter. Mary was a painter but her aspirations had been overwhelmed by the phenomenon of her husband. She had come to painting first. Her father had declared her a great talent as a child. But it was Christopher who had been anointed, right from the time they first met. There's no doubt about it that I was very jealous of Christopher. Um, I had been the one who was studying painting, and he was the one who was suddenly successful. I remember... Uh, Mrs. Lauren Harris uh, met me on the street. I, we all had to do self-portraits for our, our uh, graduation piece. And she said, oh, Mary, I saw Christopher's portrait today. She said, um, I saw yours as well. She said, but of course, Christopher's is a masterpiece. And I was pushing a carriage and had one child on reins. And I thought, oh, God damn, you know, that's probably true. And uh, I sort of lived with that for quite a long time. And the fact is, he was good, and I wasn't. There's no doubt about that. He was good, and he knew where he was going. And I didn't have a clue where I was going. All I could see was one baby after the other after the other. <laughs> in Salmonier, Mary was in an environment she had trouble understanding. She had a rambunctious pack of four children, she had to be sensitive to the demands of her husband's career. And yet, Mary painted, stealing time to dash off small impressionist style pieces on her easel in the kitchen. It could hardly be called a career until one summer day in 1969. The children had left bits and pieces on their plates and so on, and I was just pushing back my chair and getting ready to tell them that they were to clear the table. And um, I looked at this and it seemed to be absolutely perfect. What was here in front of me was perfect. And uh, I said to Christopher, we're going to take the children away because I'm going to paint this. And he said, well, that's absolute nonsense. There's all kinds of stuff here. You can't paint this in this time. We've got to eat breakfast. Why don't I take a picture for you? And I had images of myself painting from photographs. And I said, no, I would never paint from a photograph. I would never do a thing like that. And he said, oh, well, you don't have to if you don't want to, but I'm going to take the picture anyway. And months later, when the slides came back, Christopher came with a slide in his hand like this, and he put it in front of me, and he said, Now, isn't that what you wanted? Isn't that just what you wanted? And I, my God, I said, Yes, yes, that's just what I wanted. I have to admit that I was astonished when, at a certain point, Mary began to do her characteristic, you know, mature work because I, I it's, it's as if a person has had more than one life you know it's it's uh, like someone who's been I don't know uh, like Lawrence of Arabia or something who's a, a scholar and then he becomes a soldier and so on you know it's you don't expect the one to lead to the other somehow. Mary said, you know, my painting is different, you know, from what you've seen, and would you like to see it? I said, yes, I would, very much. And she took me into the little room off the big living room there that she was then using as a studio, and there were about half a dozen canvases there. I was absolutely knocked out. It was the light Mary had been looking for. The quality of light became the most important thing to her the instant she saw the sun moving across the supper table. And working from photographs allowed her to capture that light so she could get it right.
Christopher's needs had been the priority in their lives all along. But it was Christopher who was there when she needed him to help her move out from under his shadow. Christopher had the knowledge that life is not a rehearsal for life. Life is it. That's all you get. And I'd never thought of that before. I always thought that I was getting ready to do something. And I, I thought that for a very long time, despite the fact that I might roar in and do something in an immediacy, with an immediacy that he didn't have. Still, it was Christopher who knew and who said over and over again, um, you, you know, you must get on with this. This is, uh, you are not preparing to do something. You are doing it now. I am not the all-consuming talent. Never was, wouldn't pretend to be. Mary is an extremely talented painter. Um, erudite, perceptive, technically accomplished, technically confident and appropriately so. Um, is she a survivor? Yes, she's a survivor. Uh, did she survive me? No, I don't, I don't think she survived me. I think in reality she survived influences that would have made her a more ordinary person. The place that shuddered with Christopher's talent now needed to contend with Mary's as well. The household had to have help, and the Pratts found it locally by hiring Donna Meany. Mary had met her while judging a Valentine's Day contest in nearby Mount Carmel. Christopher had his eye on her too. He had been hiring local girls to pose nude for figure drawing, and he'd spotted Donna around town. I just associated uh, an ability to draw the human figure um, with professionalism. I just thought that was something you did, something that you really needed to do, um, like doing the scales on a piano. It was just part and parcel of an artist's career. I, people probably talked about behind my back, but nobody really said anything, you know. My, I had a friend who was on an airplane once, and these two ma old aunt maids, and Debbie said, oh, they were talking, and she said, oh, from Mount Carmel, and they said, oh, Debbie said, do you know Donna Meany? And they said, oh, that girl, taking her clothes off, you know. So, so people, of course, wouldn't say anything to your face, but they probably said lots behind my back. I never... It didn't bother me. But it was Donna's time at Salmonier that would cause problems for the Pratts years down the road. Christopher's 61st birthday and a party at Mary's house, surrounded by their four kids, grandkids, and relatives. You're going to help Tiff to open this? Can I, oh, that's a nice bow. Can I put the bow right here? That's a nice... Wait a minute. When Christopher comes here, to his wife's home, it's by invitation. But they're still very much husband and wife, mother and father, grandpa and grandma. Are you an orangeman? Oh, what's he doing? Barbie, what's he doing? What are you doing? He's getting ready to cry, Daddy. Oh, oh. You look like your cousin Clarence. <laughs> Anybody who says that we had careers that banged against each other is wrong. The careers were just interlaced. And I mean, I, I think that he, he did more for me than I could possibly have done for him. Because everything he had, everything he wanted to paint was already established before I met him. It had to do with his childhood, with his understanding of the world wasn't so much what he painted in, in a way. It's the attitude that he took to it. To help understand Christopher's view of the world and the world he paints, one needs to go here, the monstrous Argentia naval base, opened by the Americans in 1943, virtually in Christopher's backyard. It plunked down over 10,000 U.S. servicemen and their families. It meant jobs for locals for years, but it couldn't have been more of an assault on Christopher's childhood idea of quiet Newfoundland.
The Americans were transplanted from Oklahoma and Delaware, Washington and New York, and they created an entire world for themselves here. Christopher worked summer jobs surveying the base, and he liked the Americans as much as he could. But they had built a place so foreign on top of a place that was so familiar that his sensibilities cringed. I find it so spooky because it tells me so much, or at least I think it does, about the way people are, the way humanity is. Um, it, it sort of haunts me. And it becomes a preoccupation, the way it is to live in a place like that, the way the rooms are, the emptiness of it, uh, the futility of it. Abandoned Argentia's creepiness affects Christopher's work deeply. It's this place he thinks about, wrestles with, pours out on canvas. It casts an institutional pall over his paintings. It sneaks in here, in basement with two beds. It's overt symbolism, it's references to burial, to a graveyard. But to me, uh, in, in my reading of the painting, in, in my, dare I say, joy in that image, the sense of the way the light is there is very important to me. I think there's a, a kind of a sinister light. Frequently when I try to discuss these things and I talk about it uh, with people and, and I sort of struggle with it, um, I, I sort of wish that I had a kind of a psychiatrist's take on it. I wish that there, somewhere or other there was a psychiatrist who would look at my work and, and tell me what I'm doing. I'm not really interested in that, but uh, uh, certainly if a psychiatrist uh, was asking me the kind of questions that I frequently get asked in interviews and whatnot. You know, if the interviewer was a psychiatrist, I'd simply say, well, you tell me, buddy. <laughs> I don't really know. 1980, and rumblings that the most famous marriage in Canadian art was in trouble. Arthritis started to get the better of Mary's body. She needed a hip replacement and a lot of recovery time. The haul into St. John's from Salmonier was too much, so she and Christopher moved into a new home that they'd built in the city. And I, I couldn't handle it. I really couldn't. Um, I gave Mary a very hard time. I mean, I didn't give her, and there was no physical abuse or anything. In this day and age, you have to be very careful what you say. But I, I was petulant, awful. And, uh, you know, Mary actually wound up in hospital. She was so miserable and distressed and whatnot about it all. And I, I was a candidate for the same thing. And I, I decided I was just going to move back to this studio, to this room where we are right now. Mary split her time between the country and the city, but started to stay away from Salmonier more often. The fishing shack had become a beautiful house, but it was never her idea of home. Salmonier carried an immense amount of weight in Mary's life and work. But over the next decade, she spent more time staying in St. John's, working on national arts committees, traveling, and socializing. Most importantly, there was nationwide interest in her art. Nineteen ninety-six, the year Mary's largest retrospective toured Canada. Her life was on display, and the centerpiece was Mary's series of paintings of Donna, the Pratt's former housekeeper and Christopher's former model. Those paintings caused a stir from the time Mary had done them in the early 80s. A wife painting nudes of her husband's model using slides he had taken. So in the process of destroying this material, because I didn't want it hanging around, I didn't think it did the, did the job, but there were several slides that I thought would appeal to Mary visually. And with Donna's permission, I mean, I talked about it with Donna, and she said, sure, and, and uh, I gave Mary the slides. And, you know, I said, but you might like to do something with this, and she did. I didn't think there was anything much the matter with this. I thought that this was fine. And then 
When I started to paint Donna in my dressing gown, I was looking at Donna's face. And I suddenly realized that she was looking at Christopher and not me. And of course, this is where the great myth begins. I was looking at all of these pictures at one point, and she said, you know, I'm painting a woman looking at my husband. And, uh, you know, that's what those paintings are about. And, um, you know, you take a, a painting like a woman in my, girl in my dressing gown, and, you know, that is about rivalry. That's about female rivalry. Uh, that's about woman and other woman. Then I realized that the relationship between Christopher and Donna was different than the relationship between me and Donna. That what they had to say to each other was different than what Donna and I said to each other. That they had their own world and I had my world with Donna. And that really gave me pause to think. Those are very powerful paintings. And she once said to me that, uh, you know, in those works, I'm getting as close to, uh, to social comment or to comment about my own situation, you know, as, uh, as I ever care to come. Anyone who ever saw those paintings wondered what the artist was getting at. But when the touring collection hit Vancouver last year, rumblings and rumors leapt out into the open. A reviewer thought he saw the story of Christopher and Mary's troubled marriage on the wall. He said they were separated and that Donna had been Christopher's lover. Yes, I know, which is ludicrous. Mary, they misquoted Mary by saying, of course I had a different relationship with both of them. You don't have the same, nobody has the same relationship with anybody. So of course our relationship is gonna be different. It's improper to uh, appropriate to Donna origins of all kinds of difficulties and so on. I mean, it just doesn't fit. It, it's just, she's just, it just ain't there. Um, she's a friend. Uh, I, there's nothing else to say. She's a friend. She was here at a time in our lives when things were hopping. She was hopping. We all hopped. You know, it was a brief time. It was a good time. Well, at first I just thought it was silly. At first I just thought, oh, for God's sake, nobody's going to pay any attention to this. And then, of course, by the time the Vancouver article came out, it was in the Vancouver Sun, and the fellow hadn't even interviewed me. I realized that we had let it go too long. It's a, 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 difficult, a difficult thing to have to cope with, um, having people pick your life apart. There's only so much you can take about, you know, suggestions of that, of that sort. Donna was part of our family. What else can I say? We uh, we enjoyed. I enjoyed having her around. She babysat and all that, and um, we ate breakfast together. You know. <sighs> if my GP is watching, he may get some idea what's wrong with my lower back. I've been doing this for forty years, Doctor Edwards. Ooh. The bottom line is I wouldn't know what to do with myself if I wasn't doing this. Take two aspirin and call me on Monday, Chris. This is what I do. This is what I've done virtually every day for 40 years. Some people are kind enough to tell me what I do is good. Other people say what I do is crap. Uh, I like the people who say it's good. Uh, the people who say it's crap, uh, I hope they're not as bright as they sound. Um, I even like some of them, assuming I, assuming I give them the benefit of the doubt and think that they're being subjective and perhaps they're educated or something. But, but ultimately, you don't care. You can't care. It, it's just something that you do with something that's important to you, um, something that you can't live without. I, and uh, I know how all that sounds, but that's the way of it. Right, you look at your nan. Ah, this is a gorgeous baby. He's just a beautiful baby. I think he dreams. I think he's dreaming of an ice cream cone. Is that it? Dreaming of ice cream. Well, in fact, our lives are different every day, and some days we get on, and some days we don't get along. And I think that there are many people our age who would probably be better off living under separate roofs. Neither of us would be anything if, if somehow or other we had melted together and become one. 
I mean, if I was sitting here and saying, well, Mary and I, we think this and we think that and we like muffins and we like sugar in our coffee, you know, and, and uh, we like to go to bed at six o'clock in the evening, etc. Well, shit. I mean, you know, we'd be nothing. It, it's, it's our separateness, it's our, indi it's, it's our independence uh, that gives what we have together meaning. What are his legs oh, like? Okay, there you go. He's this fine, he's got you ten four. toes, four on one foot and six on going? the other. <laughs> the family norm. I can feel bony knees. Phil's got a plate, he's got a plate. <laughs> Isn't it just amazing, you know? I mean, they, they have toes and fingers and everything. Yeah. That's right, people are. I know, I know, but you think that they, it would take a while. <laughs> yes, when you have two very successful careers in one marriage, um, I'm sure that the stress can be tremendous. I think that they've worked out a, a, a perfect kind of situation. My mother has her studio, my father has his studio. They see each other all the time. Um, they consult each other for professional reasons. I don't ask. Uh, and we all are still a happy family. And I'm grateful for that. They're not childish. They're not, well, you've done this so I'm not going to do that kind of thing. They're, they're, um, they're, they're my parents. And um, they <laughs> I'm quite, I'm very proud of the way they've been able to handle all of this. Christopher's latest print is done. The proof mailed off to Mira Goddard's gallery in Toronto, but he's changed it. He's added the foreboding swoop of a dark raven over the Cape shore and called it My Newfoundland. Mary has started spending more time in Fredericton and in a small rented studio in Vancouver. Distance, the opposite end of the country, gives her near complete solitude to work. But Newfoundland is where she goes when she goes home. I, I'm, I, I can't say how proud I am of what Mary has done. And even to say that smacks of condescension. I'm proud of my little girl, that kind of crap. That's not part of it. I, I'm kind of proud of it in a selfish way. Um, I, I think it sort of reflects well on me, not ill. Because in truth, half the artists in Canada, half the male artists in Canada of my generation, 10 years younger, 10 years older, are married to girls who went to art school with them. And you've never heard of any of them, but you've heard of Mary. Something had to be right. It is more important for me to paint than it is for me to have a yummy life. It just is for me. It's just like my mother dressing me in dark velvet instead of taffeta. It is more important. It is more major for me. And I suspect it is more major for Christopher. Just have to do it. Our whole lives have been based on that line of excellence, of denial of other things towards that end. And the end gets closer and closer, of course. You begin to hear the rumbling of the falls the older you get. <laughs> and uh, so. And, and as you become physically weaker, that the flame at the end becomes brighter and you just are attracted to that and you go for it. You go for it more than you ever did with more determination and, um, and with more concentration and there just isn't room for another human being. There isn't room to be as generous as you must be and that's too bad. But then the people who say we play bridge and we go to Florida, maybe that's their art, you see. And maybe this is mine. Very amazing.
when we used to when we used to go collecting stones with the kids, we'd tell them they could take three. <laughs> and if they had three in their hand in order to pick up another one, they had to drop one. Yeah. Life's like that, eh? I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> you got three and you want four, you gotta get rid of one. Right, right. Did you repeat that one though? They, oh yes, oh God, yes. I've never seen anything like it. It's absolutely exquisite. It's not quite as nice when it's dry, does it? I won't let it get dry. I'll keep licking it. <laughs> <laughs>